So how's it going, everybody? Welcome, welcome to Visually Building a Headless WordPress Site with Clutch. My name is Jeff Everhart, and I'm joined today uh, by a number of members from the team at Clutch.io. Um, they are a visual builder who is sort of refocusing some of their efforts to engage the headless WordPress community. Um, and we're super pumped to have them here. I think you'll get to hear really more from them today than you will me. Um, and as always, I have a couple of things that I just want to remind everybody of as we kick off the event. One, etiquette alert. So please be excellent to each other in the chat. Um, this is being recorded. So like I said, we're gonna cut out everything that sort of happened up until just a second ago, but everything that happens from here on in will be uh, live on YouTube eventually. And so if you could avoid making me have to go back through and edit out anything inappropriate, I would certainly appreciate it. Um, I don't think we have a ton of demo resources today. I know that the people from Clutch will be using like a headless WordPress URL. So please don't like DDoS that and just be kind to everything that we show you. Um, but again, yeah, welcome. Big thanks to the team from Clutch. Um, and I, with that, I think I'll just kick it back over to, I think you, Matthew, right? And for, for kind of just a general Clutch intro. And this is a, a screenshot of their newly redesigned, relaunched website, which I recommend that you all check out at clutch.io. Thanks. Yeah. Well, or don't. We threw that thing together in like two days in anticipation of this uh, webinar. And if you do DDoS it, the back end is running on WP Engine, so you can test the resilience <laughs> of their systems. Don't yes. blame us. Um, no, but what you what you are seeing today, especially the, uh, the WordPress back end, is running on WP Engine, and um, uh, so uh, and everything is live, and, and this stuff is working. So, um, but let's go and kind of you know, and we're not, and, and I say that to say that we're not actually launched yet, so we just sign up for the wait list. Uh, but we do plan on launching uh, uh, some like around January. We're gonna let we're gonna let our team breathe through the holidays and not and not uh, you know cause people to miss their family over this. But expect that our uh, the launch should happen sometime in January. In the interim, if you are an agency and you want us to white glove onboard you uh, and help you get going, and you're willing to trade us for free early access for feedback, we're willing to make that trade. Um, so what you are seeing today is the state of the tool as of today. So if you're, you know, it probably will crash and things will happen. And if you see that and you're still like, yes, sign me up for that alpha software, we'd be more than happy to do that for you. Um, yeah, I'm Matthew. I used to run a uh, an agency in Houston called Poetic. And uh, we had uh, close to 50 designers and developers working together um, for customers of, of all different sorts, mainly real estate and energy companies, which is what we have a lot of here in Houston. And uh, every time a customer would come in, they'd want something different. They want, you know, the real estate company is one of these ILS websites that ranked really, really well on, um, on Google. And so search optimization was a really big deal and having a big database powering it and fast search was a really big deal. Um, we had these energy companies, we had some startup customers that wanted backends built in Ruby on Rails, but you named it. We had WordPress, Drupal, Ruby on Rails. And uh, it started really putting a strain on, on our agency because none of these backends share a way to build the front end that's the same. When it was Ruby on Rails, we would do ERB. When it was WordPress, a lot of times it was a theme or a theme building theme or like a page building theme. And when it was Drupal, it's like, forget about it. You got to code everything from scratch. Drupal is just like a pile of code. Have fun. Uh, so, you know, we'd always talk to the customer. The customer would kind of dictate the requirements and kind of figure out the back end that they wanted. And then we just had to kind of deal with it on the way that we built the front end. Um, and then along came Webflow. And Webflow was, was very interesting to us because let's say 10 to 20% of our websites didn't really need a backend at all. And we found that our designers could learn Webflow and then they could take it all the way through and launch the site. And this changed everything because now everything started being built the same way. And we stopped having these, even though we had 50 people working together, it was really like 10 people knew this stuff, 10 people knew that stuff. Uh, and, and it caused resource constraint issues all over the place. But with Webflow, our designer took it all the way through. No developers got involved with the building of this site. I almost feel like I could be like a disclaimer. No developers were harmed in the, you know, <laughs> you could just, you could just build the whole disclaimer. site. disclaimer. Yeah, no feelings were hurt. Uh, but we could get it all the way through that way. And customers loved it because the customer could sit down with the designer and say, can you move this? Can you do that? 
And rather than nudging it in, uh, in Figma and then making a ticket and then waiting for version control and then having the developer do it and then push it, they would just go, yeah, nudge, are you good with that? And then they'd hit publish and it'd go live. And this light bulbs went off and I was like, that's the way that it should be. Why isn't all of it that way? Why isn't, wh why aren't all of the front end building for all the different back ends one where the designer handles most of the process and the engineers really get involved for the hard things? for data connections, for, uh, for business logic that's custom, for powerful pieces, but shouldn't the designer really be doing most of it? So our whole agency transformed to this model and we noticed something, our designs got better because our designers stopped building in uh, graphic tools and started building in tools that had the constraints of the web. So they knew what was and wasn't possible going into it and they worked with the constraints instead of against the constraints. And what, what ended up happening there is we stopped making promises to clients in the form of a PDF or a picture that, you know, started stopped writing checks that we couldn't cash is what I was saying. The designers mm -hmm. keep writing checks that our developers can't cash. Yeah. And it was, a, some of and those, it really to cash some of those checks in my day. And then the designers and developers are just mad at each other. Like, Dude, yeah. why did you do that? Yeah. Don't you know what Flexbox is? And the designers Or like, no, I explain I, I why know. this is complicated to implement. And they're like, well, like now you're hampering my creativity. And yeah, so I've, we've, I think we've, most of us who've done front end work have definitely been in that space where it's a, it's a give and take sometimes and not always uh, balanced. A hundred percent. And then we started saying, once the designer got in, now they had empathy for what the developer was going through. And uh, then the developers realized we don't like writing CSS anyways. Like what developer is going, you know what I would love to do? I just spent the fat past four years taking boot camp and learning engineering. I really want to go to work and look at a Figma file of a button. And then I really want to type a button tag. And then I want to go into CSS and I want to type in border one P X. Wait, what color was that? Pound F, 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 you know, like that's what developers are doing. Why aren't we writing business logic? Why aren't we using our brains? And so I found this amazing thing within two years, once the designers uh, started doing everything in Webflow and once the uh, engineers started only working on the hard problems, everybody was happier. And we went from probably 25% designers to 75% engineering to a good even 50-50 split. And the engineers, uh, even during planning meetings, were spending more time figuring out the feature set, the back end, the data requirements, and the designers were able to now own the visual, the UI, the UX, and it was and it was fantastic. And we said, how can we do this for every project? So the first thing that my company did is we built a converter that converted Webflow into React. And this was great, and it was all on CI. So you could save your WordPress site, and then our CI process would crawl the uh, site map convert the whole WordPress site into React components, and then our engineers would connect those onto all the backends. So that was our alpha product. And it was great, and we landed some really big customers that way. And, uh, but then we got upset because like in WordPress, the data wasn't real yet. It was all, or, sorry, in Webflow, the data wasn't real yet. And it wasn't until post-CI that we could get real data. So we actually, at one point, I called up Vlad, the CEO at uh, Webflow, and we were like one of their biggest agencies. And I'm like, hey man, can we, can, can we work this out? And we were working for uh, a large company in California uh, whose logo is a fruit. And, uh, and we said, can you know, we've got this company here and they really like this workflow, but they don't like that we're using Webflow because they're saying that we're putting their intellectual property in the cloud. Can you get us a copy of Webflow that can run on, uh, that's right, on Grapes Inc. server <laughs> because Grapes Inc., they're really protective of their IP and they're really secretive. Privacy oriented. Um, can you, privacy oriented. Thank you. It's a privacy. Think about a grape that has a lock on it. Uh, anyways, can you get a copy of, of, of Webflow that we can run on their servers? And can, by the way, can we start working on building real React components into it? And he was, and it's good for them, but he's kind of like, that's not on a roadmap. We're not going to do that. And that's what a good founder should do is stick to their guns and not bend to the will of every request. But it was kind of deflating. And I go, I'm going to, I remember being there. Uh, I was sitting there in California and I was like, I'm going to sell my agency and I'm going to go solve this problem. We're going to do it because there should be a web flow, which is badass, but there should be a web flow that's built in React for every backend that runs on top of real, real React components. And that's what we built. So the very first thing I did is I, I went to go find a co-founder 
and uh, I found Bruno and uh, he was working on relax. And his story goes something like he was one of the top selling themes, uh, theme people for like theme builders on uh, Envato. And he's oh, wow. slinging these high end themes, tons of them. And uh, he builds a theme building theme. He builds one of the first theme building themes and things are going really, really well. But he starts to get pissed off with the limitations of, um, of WordPress. And so he, de- like I'm declaring war on Webflow. He's declaring <laughs> war on WordPress at the same time. And he builds, and I think the repo is still out there. And he builds a repo called Relax uh, along with one of the other, uh, one of the other guys that works at uh, Clutch now. And it, it's pretty big. It gets like 10,000 stars and it's starting to take off. Okay. And so we sort of meet right there. I'm declaring the war on Webflow. He's declaring, declaring war on WordPress. And we're like, man, if we combine our powers, we can build this universal front end builder for every back end. So that's the, that's the villain origin story there for everybody. Okay. That's why this thing Taking on uh, big exists. CMS. I like it. I yeah, like it. Freaking big CMS. And by the way, the other Matt also uh, from Houston and lives here. And so I've kind of got this chip on my shoulder that uh, <laughs> that we got we got to take him on. We got to take on. He won't. Mom, he won't be named. Oh, yeah. sorry. Just um, <laughs> no, no, no. All good. Uh, all good. Yeah. Uh, but I just thought that was kind of a funny thing from Houston. Like, what are the odds of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But anyways, um, so to kind of segue from kind of like why we exist uh, for, for agencies, by agencies, for agencies, a way that your team can build for every backend using one universal front end builder. Uh, our first focus right now is on WordPress. Um, but I think from there, maybe we segue this into uh, Alex, can you? Okay. Yeah. I'll stop sharing share screen, your screen and we'll pass the baton here and actually show some people, some demo stuff. And I'm really excited for this. I when when they showed me the initial demo, there's just some so much cool stuff here that they've built that I, it's 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 absolutely cool. Yeah, and and so here here is a uh, clutch, and it's alpha glory. So there will likely be some bugs and some crashes and some things. But um, the first thing is I want everybody to notice that this is an Electron app. So we originally were a web based app, similar to Webflow, but we actually found that there's a lot of things that aren't as good uh, when you try to build in the uh, inside of a browser. Uh, first thing is you have all the extra browser Chrome that's taking up space. And space becomes crucial when you're trying to work on a whole web page and you have all this tooling and you stick around it. The second thing is we're running a real copy of Next.js. So when you boot up our app, it runs uh, a real copy of Next.js on your computer, which really wasn't possible using uh, a web uh, browser, a real web browser. Um, the third reason why we did this is because we found that when you're working on something on a more powerful website, a lot of times you might just want to bust open your code editor or have a developer on your team, which we'll talk about how you can work together at the same time. They might want to pop open VS Code. I'm a Vim guy, so I want to pop open Vim and be able to work on some of the code files if, if need be. And that's also not easily possible on the web. One more. You want to work on an image asset and you want to open up the image directly in Figma or Photoshop or whatever, you can do that when it's desktop based. So for all of those reasons, we just decided to go all in on building this electron based, the easy, quick open in a browser thing we get is good. And it's one feature, but the amount of stuff that you lose when you go uh, into a pure web environment, we didn't think was worth it. So with that, we don't have this fake web version that you're running and you don't see the real thing until you deploy it. No, we're running a real full Next.js server. All of these tools are all running on your computer automatically by opening our Electron app. And so, um, so that's pretty great. And you get a lot more performance out of it as well when you, when you run it for real and not like kind of wasm it and hit memory limits and stuff. So uh, when we do release this and you come off the wait list, you will be downloading an app. That being said, we have the collaboration features that you would have in a web-based version. So you can see in here right now, uh, towards the bottom left, we got uh, Luis Correa is in here, um, as well as Alex. Uh, so they're both in here working together in real time. So it has all the same collaboration benefits, but it is Electron. In the middle, you've got the Canvas. Now, there's some really cool things about our Canvas. Like I said, a lot of these tools, you're kind of working on a fake version that's not stateful. And then when you hit play, the real version launches elsewhere. And sometimes it's like loading and it takes forever, and then you get the real version. But in our case, working in Clutch, this canvas is the live copy of the app and you can switch between interaction uh, uh, selection mode, which is what he's, uh, Alex is in now, or if you click play, 
wherever you are, you're now, that's now the live site and you can click around and there's no flicker and no nothing because it's always, it's always live. This is always the actual site you're working on. So uh, that's, that's a pretty cool thing there. Now we are built on top of Next.js and uh, the new Next.js app directory way of working. So for the engineers on here, if you know what I'm talking about, under the hood, this is generating a Next code base. To show you that, uh, Alex, if you could click on that folder, this is gonna launch VS Code and you can see the app directory uh, and you can see your see all this stuff. So as we're working, this thing is doing code generation under the hood and the code is very clean and looks exactly as it would if a developer wrote it. All right, so can we go, uh, and so if you make changes, you'll see them here. If you make changes here, you can see them reflected back. Um, now, here on the top left corner, we see site layout and posts, and that comes from the way that Next.js works. In Next.js, you build layouts, and then you nest pages inside of those layouts. So could you open up the navigator? And you can see that here, site layout looks like a folder, and then inside of that, we have posts, blog posts, and uh, another page called Revalidate. But these pages are all inside of a shared singular site layout. So a lot of these uh, page builders, you would build like a header component and a footer component. You have to paste it on every single page. We allow you to create layouts and the layouts can even nest and then you can stick pages inside of them and that whole system that comes from Next.js works beautifully. There's another benefit to this. If you stick components on every page that are shared components, the whole page is re-rendering between page navigation. In our case, only what needs to be re-rendered is sent to the browser. So there's a huge performance benefit gain by using a true uh, nested layout system like we have here. Awesome. And can I jump in and ask a couple of questions? Um, just Please. kind of for the devs watching afterwards. So like that that's awesome. And that's one of the really cool things. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Next.js 13 and obviously where Faust is going with that and the shared layouts uh, becomes just a huge selling point of this new app directory thing. And so Clutch can kind of just mimic that as far up and down you know, your route hierarchy as you want. We could have sh shared layouts inside of shared layouts and things like that. Absolutely. And that's okay. what those breadcrumbs do up there. On this demo right now, we only have the one layout, but there's yep. a create new layout button and a create new page button. Oh, top, excellent. Right? Oh, I see. I see. Pages. Yep, right there. Okay. And you can create as many as you want and you can nest them as many as you want. A good example would probably be you're always probably going to want a site layout. Mm -hmm. That's got like your background and maybe your yep. header and your footer. But you might want to create a layout for just your blog style pages that have like navigations and stuff. Yeah. And you could do that. So only your blog stuff could be in the layout. And then maybe you also have an e-commerce section of your site where you can make an e-commerce layout that's got the shopping cart icon and stuff in it. And that's what's so great. So, um, and then it's going to be smart because when you navigate over to the shopping cart side of the site, it's going to know to reload more of the page. But once you're inside of the shopping cart side of the site, It'll only mm -hmm. reload little pieces. So it's uh, very, very cool there. Um, all right, so can we open the Navigator back up? So if you uh, click on the Posts page there, and then you're going to see uh, as you click Pages, we'll handle navigating you to the right place. Uh, and then you can work on those, or you can actually click around using the actual page itself, which will also navigate you. And then you can see that in the breadcrumbs, You've got posts, and then you've got the site layout on the outside, and it makes it really easy to jump around and make changes. That's how pages works. Uh, pages have paths, like slash posts, or the blog post is slash post slash slug, which is how you can make them dynamic. Mm -hmm. It follows the exact same patterns you're going to get in Next.js. Then down from there, we have component spaces, and this is where things become really cool. So let's click in a blog card. Everything in Clutch is component-based. We allow you to visually create React components by dragging and dropping, and then you just right-click and hit Create Component. In this case, right-click, hit Create Blog Card. Boom, you get a blog card. But that's not enough. When you create a component, you usually want many variants of it, and maybe even a dark mode and a light mode version of it. So we give you this infinite canvas, and you can zoom out, and you can create as many frames as you want, and you can zoom in, and you can work on things. It feels a lot like working in Figma. And... Um, and this is really neat because it gives you a, a place to sort of isolate off and work on just one component. And this might come in handy. There might be a demo later. I don't know. I don't want to spoil anything. There might be a demo later about turning these things into Gutenberg blocks, but we'll see what <laughs> happens. I don't know. Maybe there will be. Maybe there won't be. But these components are what you're going to uh, drag and you're going to insert into your pages. And these components maybe get used in other neat and interesting ways as well. But this gives you a way to sort of document your design system uh, 
that you're building. I see a question came in. Yeah, yeah. So Fran asks, how does this handle gated content with routes that need authenticated users? Could you make a login page via visual edit? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll show you that in, in, uh, in page settings. Okay. Can you open up a uh, you open up a page? That's uh, post, yeah. Go to settings there. And so in here, you have uh, the ability to make paths. You have the ability to uh, create dynamic segments in your paths. You have the ability to control all of your SEO. So if you go read the Next.js docs and you go read their metadata section about optimization mm -hmm. and creating open graph, creating Twitter, uh, creating dynamic social images, all that, uh, we support most of them. We plan to support literally all of the optimization section of Next.js. But in here is also where uh, you can add authentication um, to a page. You could say okay. this page needs to be authenticated. In fact, if you need to, you can click edit code and that's just going to, uh, and if you just want to go yeah, write I was your say, own we custom just authentication, eject just do it. Just yeah. throw slap a slap a, if, if not user, you redirect somewhere else. Um, and that's exactly. part of what I think seems really cool. It's like you get to use this in combination with at any time, just kind of ejecting and then digging into the code and just implementing whatever you want in just raw JavaScript. Um, it sounds really cool. Exactly. And what we did is we said, we don't want to add an API and it's not ejecting. I want to point this out. Okay. Okay. F ejecting yeah. means you can't get it back. Right. Cause when you eject and remember back in the day with create react app, nobody uses it anymore. Once you eject, there's no going back. Ejecting means save the pilot, but screw the jet and it's going to crash. We don't, we don't do that. So okay. uh, I like that y'all brought that up. This is, this is a uh, built in first party. This is encouraged like, yeah, hit edit code. Okay. And what this is going to do, and then we didn't invent a new API. It uses Next.js as API. So what that's going to do is it's going to give you access to the page's definition. So in Next.js, there's a page.jsx file that you create, and uh, this gives you access to that code. And so then you can go read any any authentication provider's Next.js docs. Clerk, you could read, uh, uh, what's some of the other ones? Auth0. There's tons of these out there. All of them are going to have docs on how to integrate with them uh, with Next.js, read those docs, copy that code, paste it into ours, and it'll work perfectly with no no extra shoehorning required mm -hmm. for clutchification, if you will. We also, however, will have uh, first party authentication providers in our marketplace. So if you need a no code way to do it, but we okay. every you're going to notice this all over the app. We like it. We like uh, what we call escape hatches instead of ejection. We like escape yeah. Hatches. That's maybe it's a like, better word. That's a better yeah. word. We don't want to put you in jail. We, we felt like we were in jail with some of the visual builders. So like, for example, there's these, like in Elementor or in uh, Webflow, you'll notice like, I want to do this specific CSS thing that's not supported. And it'll be like, all right, you got to inject a bunch of crap into the head tag and do all this. No, mm -hmm. we'll have an edit code button for you. If you want to do code, we encourage it. So anyways, this is page settings. All of this stuff maps to the Next.js meta information. All of this stuff can be bound to what's returned from WordPress. So you can make your, you can make everything dynamic from your backend as well. Um, but let's keep rolling back into, um, yeah, like there you can see that that title was coming yeah. from data. data. Title. Yeah, that's really cool. So this is dynamically powered. All, uh, all of that will get there. But let's keep rolling. So we're on that blog card. Let's go back to that space. And, uh, Basically, you think about it, your pages, you don't really build, the page is really just a collection of components at that point. Most of your work is done on components and pages are just slapping those components together. Uh, and so you build these uh, nice components and you drag them onto pages, but that's component spaces. And uh, we, for those of you who are familiar with Storybook, we even are working on and have tested a Storybook export. So this thing can export and build you a Storybook. And oh, these wow. components can actually be used uh, you can publish them to NPM and you can use them as a developer. So if you have projects even where you don't want to build the whole thing in clutch, but you want to build your design system in clutch, you can do that. Um, let's go to workspaces and workspaces are the final thing that you have. So you have your pages and your site, your component library that you're building and you have workspaces. They're Miro boards, they're fig jams, just a place to go test things out. Uh, if you want to kind of see what something would look like before turning it officially into a component, or if you want to test an idea out, that's what these are. All right, so next thing down from there, and I'm gonna to try to hurry this up, uh, but the next thing down from there is gonna be your layer uh, your layer tree or your composition tree. 
and this just, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. You've seen this in every visual builder you've ever used. It's what things are made out of. Next thing down from there is gonna be your insert menu. Uh, and what we do is we give you a set of primitives and, and uh, these primitives are uh, either from Next.js or they map directly to a web element. So we don't invent anything new. You're not gonna be working with some weird element set that we created for you. Block, for example, you might as well be called element and it, you, you drag that sucker out and it gives you, and it's, uh, you can set any tag that you want on it and that's what renders in your code. Uh, flex rows and flex columns are really a template on top of block that give you a set of rows or a set of columns mm -hmm. just to make doing layout faster. Grids the same way. Text, the text element, paragraph, span, and so on. Link is a next link. So it's not a normal href, it's a next link. Uh, if you want to read about the, why next link is so great, you just read the docs on next link. Image is a next image. And we are going to spend a minute, minute on this one. This thing is really freaking cool. We have this where it automatically creates all of your responsive images for you. You don't do anything. You, do you have a 12 megabyte photo and you just upload it and use it? Don't worry about it. Don't even optimize it. We handle it all with the next image component. It'll automatically create like 12 copies of it. And then whenever you actually drag that out, you get the whole source set of all of the proper images and Google uh, using Lighthouse or PageSpeed is gonna give you a perfect rate ranking. So we made it really hard to shoot yourself in the foot by having unoptimized images. Um, we're working on where we'll even load a blurred version of it first and then flip in and all of the goodies that uh, are in the Next.js framework are all handled automatically and it feels just like using a normal image component. Then you've got an if and a loop. These are the only last two things you need as a primitive to build pretty much anything. So if is like, you might have some, uh, you might wanna say like, if this field from uh, that's being returned from your backend is X, then do something. And if it's Y, do something. Or maybe if mm -hmm. it's missing, don't render anything. It's just a way to make things conditionally render. And then loops are important for whenever you have like a blog index and it returns 10 items. You actually just stick one block in there and it repeats it the 10 times. And it, and it feeds you the data for each row. All right, the next tab over is gonna be libraries. So earlier we talked about how you build that component library. Well, you can, not all projects in Clutch are a website. Some of them are a library. And here we're looking at, we have a thing called Clutch UI Kit, which is a different project. That's just a whole bunch of components. And Alex, can you actually click on that and I click back out so they can see the whole root of it? Yeah. Here's my project. And, and you've seen this already, but click on Clutch UI Kit. And so uh, what's cool is, let's say that you're an agency that works only on service companies, or maybe you work on real estate companies, and you want to build a whole bunch of common parts that you can use across all your sites. Build a project, call it My Agency Components or Library or whatever, and then you publish that just to your own organization, and then any project you create after that can drag and drop those components out. So we have our own UI kit that we like to use. That's what we call theme aware. So it uses our theming system. And as we drag these things into customer sites, picks on the customer theme, you're ready to rock and roll. And if you make updates to these, you can roll it out across all your sites. So if you can click into like accordion or something, and then you can see here the accordion component that we have, and then you would just drag and drop this thing out. So this is a pretty cool feature. Next is the marketplace. I'm giving everybody the whirlwind tour uh, of the tool. There's a lot here. Uh, so down here at the bottom, you can see Clutch the Agency. Clutch, these are our orgs. You can see the packages that are in them that we built. But you can build your own Lego kits, or you can even share them with the total Clutch community, or the whole Clutch community. Um, we need to clean a lot of this out before we launch, because a lot of these are tests and things. But it's really easy. One-click publish, and you can share uh, any project's library with your team or with everybody. That's the marketplace. Um, next thing down from there is going to be the uh, themes panel. This might be confusing because in WordPress, themes mean one thing and in mm -hmm. our tool, themes mean another. We might be renaming this to variables before we launch because Figma's decided to name it variables. That seems to be taking off as what people are going to name this panel. But um, it's variables. Let's just say that. And mm -hmm. what it is is a set of tokens, set of variables that you can set. And then all the content that's built in Clutch is kind of mapped against these variables. And that way, if you drag something out of our marketplace, it takes on your brand immediately. You don't have to go like redo all the colors. So where does variable set come from? We looked at some really popular things like Tailwind that have a very mature token set. And we took inspiration from there. But one cool thing about our variable set that you're not going to get in a tool like Figma uh, is, is that these variable sets mean something when you go to do styling. So if I go to click a uh, color, 
on the styling panel, it'll only give me the, it'll find the needle in the haystack. It'll only give me my colors. If I go to set a border, it knows to pull from borders. If I go to set a shadow, it knows to pull from shadows and so on. And so uh, you can see how that works here. You can search your tokens, but you can also just pick a color. Like you don't have to use this. If you just, uh, you can type one in or you can use a color picker here, but we really encourage you to, uh, to, to use these tokens because if you, and you can create your own tokens because if you do, you're building much more systematically and the content becomes extremely portable. So definitely if you're building a library to share with your team and you use the shared tokens, imagine how fast you can build a site by dragging, dropping a button in and it looks like that brand and then dragging the button into the next project and it looks like that brand. People are gonna think you're some sort of wizard agency. Like how did you do this so fast? So that's, that's, uh, that's themes, probably gonna be renamed to variables before launch. Uh, next thing there, and we're almost done with the whirlwind tour is project settings. The only thing that you need to know here is as you install plugins, some of them need some settings. The WordPress plugin is installed on this one. And what we need from you is your WordPress URL, which you can see at smokingmeats.wpenginepower.com. Uh, and then you have the Faust secret key, which we need to do some wizardry, which we'll talk about later. Uh, pretty simple. You install it, you pop a couple of keys in, and uh, you can test the connection and it'll run through a connection test and, and, and tell you if it was uh, green or whether or not it might go, hey, you're missing Faust or whatever. That's that. Then you got the publish tab. Uh, this is uh, pretty neat. You can have as many destinations as you want. So you want staging, canary, production, whatever, you can do that. And um, it's one click. If you click that blue button, you're publishing. There's nothing to set up, nothing to do. It just works. So there's that. We do have other types. So this is clutch hosting uh, for Atlas, but you can actually click that down, click the type uh, arrow over there and you can see, uh, or make a new destination. We also have the marketplace. So if you create a project and you don't want to publish it to Clutch Hosting, you publish it to the marketplace. That's what makes it a library. And then you publish it to NPM, you can give it to the engineers. It'll actually create an NPM page with a readme. And yeah, you can use your components that way. Um, we've already gone over the folder. We've already gone over a uh, real-time multiplayer uh, down there, but history is a cool one. This is especially useful for agencies because under the hood, this is running a Git compatible version control system. So Alex is in here or Alex and Luis are in here and they're working. You just do your work. I can see uh, the red outline around it wanted to get fired up at work. That's Luis. You can see he's red. You can, he's making changes on a different computer. Those changes are flowing in live onto Alex's computer. I mean, it is like Google Docs when you're working in this wow. tool, but it's like, it's like Google Docs that has Git running under the hood. We will be releasing uh, branching and merging. Uh, which is not in here, but it is safe because you can roll back at any point and either one of them can uh, can click commit and it'll make a commit. Uh, so this is one of my favorite features because we always had trouble figuring out how to get designers to use Git. Like they never could figure it out. We tried using uh, abstract and some other things, and but this actually gets the designers and the developers on the same footing uh, with continuous integration and then you publish with version control under the hood and you can roll back to any reversion, revision and our branching feature is really awesome because you can start a feature branch and then multiple people can go into that branch in real time. And other people can go into a different feature branch and work real time and then you can merge them together. So it's like live Google Docs Git. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, I'm not gonna, for sake of time, I'm not even gonna go over some of this other stuff very deep. Uh, can we go to a page and then just show them like quick breakpoints? Uh, this is all table stake stuff you've seen in other visual editors anyways. Uh, you click breakpoints and you make changes. You reduce the columns to two. There, you reduce the columns to one. You click on elements, you make styling changes. They save inside the breakpoints. Uh, not a big deal there. Um, if you click the moon icon, it's going to switch your theme between the light mode tokens and the dark mode tokens. Oh, so neat. another feature of theming, you click the theming panel really quick and you'll see that open. Every one of your named tokens has two values that are available to you, a light mode value and a dark mode value. And that's built right into every site you create. You don't have to wire that up. You get that. By default, they're all the same. So by default, switching doesn't do anything. But if you want to, you can start creating your dark mode set, basically. And bam, you got dark mode. All pretty automagic. Um, then from there, Alex, if we could click on an element and you could show them kind of styling, and then we can show them properties. And then I think you'll take it over from there. So... Uh, he just entered what's called isolation mode, which he'll go over more later, but he double, we do have the ability to edit a component in place rather than having to go to its 
own component space. So right now you can look at the breadcrumbs. We're in the site layout. We're on the post page. We're in the blog card component now. And then we're inside of its default variant. Yes, we have a full variant system. So you can create variants if you have a, a warning or a danger card or a, or, or a uh, featured mode that you want to stick a component in. We do have a whole full variant system, which we're not going to demo today, but it's there. Inside of this component he's entered into, he's working on the title uh, there. And uh, you can see the styling panel over on the right. Before we launch, there will be more of these panels built out like item and styles, you're gonna see backgrounds and you'll see more of these like specially built out panels. But we do have every single thing in CSS mapped out to a widget. So you just start typing the whole CSS, there's over 450 CSS uh, things that are supported here. Wow. And they are all bound to that theming system. So we know what in CSS goes to what theme set uh, in the theming system. And uh, this was no small feat. But you can see there when he goes to font size, it knows to pull from font sizes. So everything's everything's known, everything's semantic. Uh, another cool thing is if you if you're a designer and you're like, I wonder what font size does. If you click on the word font size on the left, uh, it gives you the docs straight from MDN. And if you still want to learn more, you can click learn more, and that'll pop MDN open. So designers can discover how all 450 things in CSS work by simply just clicking on them, using them, playing with them, and you get you get your docs there. We decided to not obfuscate or, or abstract away from the way that CSS works under the hood. It We, we are kind of one-to-one -one with it, and we figured we're gonna help people learn as they go. But that's that's how uh, the styling panel works. Like I said, in the future, more of it will be into these pre-built nicer sections, but for right now, we do support the entire CSS specification. Last panel would be properties. Uh, and anything that you're working on has properties. So we're on a text element now. Uh, Alex, if you could click on the properties tab, this is going to give you like the React properties, if you will, of that. So we can set the tag. And you can set the text on a uh, text element. And that's pretty much it. There's more to this tool, but I wanted to give you an orientation of the whole tool before Alex mm -hmm. takes over. The funny thing is, Alex demo is actually pretty short because making changes in this tool is pretty easy. So it might feel a little underwhelming what you're about to see here, but um, uh, before I kind of hand it over to Alex, does anybody have any questions? Over yeah, what anybody got any questions? I know we covered a lot. I, I have maybe a question about the components. What? How would I add behavior to a component in Clutch? So everything in Clutch will be a server component uh, okay. by default. So when you start thinking about like this is really fried all baked all of our noodles because we got started on this obviously whenever server components weren't yeah. the same and then it came out and we would go ah, yeah we got to rebuild all the flesh this sucks <laughs> we really did we had to like almost start over because we had oh, a no, whole I, I, we system totally did and we were like building like Redux and like how can we centralize state management and people were like state management that's totally 2022. State's not a thing we do anymore. It's server components. And we're like, all right, we'll throw all that away. Um, but everything will be a server component by default. But if you want to, uh, but server actions do work. You will be able to post to a server action and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of the stuff will be shipped via okay. uh, pl uh, plugins or things you'll get from the marketplace. But if you did, like, let's say you wanted to make a button that you can click that says, hello world. Uh, what you would do is you would go to a component and then you could write that part as code. And you, okay, you gotcha. Would, uh, okay. You would have an on, it would say like on click. Yeah. And then you would just hit like, I want to make that into code. And it would say fine. And it actually opens a little code box and you could say alert, hello world. And then you would hit save and, you know, Bob's your uncle. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty intuitive um, how all well that stuff works. I think for this, actually, Alex is going to go over later in this demo actually how to just like, create a coded what we call a coded component one that you okay. can drag in here and it's gonna be pretty cool and then that kind of answers all the questions about well how would i do x the answer is is that you just kind of do it you just do it the way you would do it if you were doing react gotcha, for those things. Gotcha. The, the developer sort of builds the little legos that you're missing and hands them to a designer and then the designer has freedom is, is the okay. answer cool so, any, so, any sorry i distract us yeah throw us throw them in the chat i just want to just just going to play time cop a little bit we're at 46 so um, yeah, maybe if you got questions, throw them in the chat. Maybe we just toss it to Alex and kind of keep the train rolling and we'll, we'll circle awesome. back at the end. Um, and if anything comes up between then and now, 
uh, now and then, I will uh, definitely point it out. Yeah. All right. And Alex Sounds and good. Luis, we're going to have to fly. Sure thing. Yeah. I, I, I'll do a real quick demo here. Um, so I, I do want to go back to that one question. Um, there's the ability to make code components in Clutch so you could write your own code. You could even import code from NPM if you wanted to. I'll show that in an example. Uh, but even if you wanted to run some type of logic on this card itself, I, I don't know, you want to use use state or maybe you need to pass a ref through somehow. Um, we do have a component configuration where you can add logic to oh, components okay. themselves. Uh, so you get this little code window, um, write your logic and then return any of the values that you need to return. Um, my, I want to go through a typical workflow of, you know, what do we need to do to make updates to our components or updates to the site and get a, a you know, a brand new publish out, uh, out and live. Um, so, you know, let's go ahead and add a date to these, um, these blog cards. Um, I would typically jump into the blog card workspace. Um, I would add a new field, a new text component to be able to render out some date. Uh, and by opening up my insert menu and jumping back to the primitives here. I can, let me actually jump into the blog card itself because that's what I do want to edit. Uh, we touched on isolation mode a little bit. So whenever you double click into components that you've created, you get this isolation window uh, to where your screen is more focused on the component itself that you're editing and the composition um, that you're editing in. Um, so back to the primitive, uh, I drag my primitive over, um, I can drag it onto the canvas. I'm going to use the composition tree just so I have a little bit more uh, accuracy as I'm dragging and dropping that in there. Uh, and I could, I'll double click uh, the component itself to give it a new name. Uh, we'll name it date since I've been naming all these other components uh, for sake of clarity. And that way, if I ever have to pass this project off to another person and they take it over, they immediately have an idea of what they need to edit. Um, so we have our date text here. Uh, we can type in uh, a random date. We'll use today's date. Um, and once we type in that date, we now have uh, that date rendering on all of our cards. But we notice that all of the cards are rendering the same exact date. So we will need a way to be able to make this dynamic. Typically on the component, you would create, you know, a date property and then pass that proper, you know, pass those props down into the card itself. We've made it really easy in Clutch to do a one-click expose. So go back to that component that I created, go to the text property and just expose it right to the top. I'll name this property date for sake of clarity again. And when we bounce back up to the parent blog card, we now see that date coming through uh, and we can alter the date. We'll do yesterday's date. And now we're able to edit the date per instance of each card itself. So now we need to go back to the post where we're rendering data from our backend. Uh, and we want this to be dynamic dates coming from the back end itself. Um, and we need to bind data that's flowing in. Uh, so we'll dive back into the composition. We'll find our blog card that's inside of our blog card grid, uh, it's, which is another component that I had created that's essentially just using that loop component that Matthew had discussed. I'm taking an array of all of my WordPress data, so all of my um, WordPress blog post, and then just looping over each individual one of those and then getting my cards out and then binding that data to each one of these properties here. So we have this new date property and we'll change the, the type, um, the control type to that of a variable to just make binding easier. I'm gonna use the actual variable and not write any code. So I have one click binding, go to my variables, find my blog card grid that's looping over my data and then go to my individual item and then look for the date that's coming in from WordPress. I'll just use this first date that I ran across for the sake of the demo. And we now have dynamic dates rendering across all the blog cards. Uh, another thing that you may want to change and edit is the themes. We talked about all the theme tokens. We showed you some of the theme uh, settings themselves on the styles panel, but let's change Let's change the, the primary color here from this blue. Maybe we want to use the orange color 
uh, that's on dark mode because we just really like that for our brand. Uh, so I'll search for orange in my color. I don't have to use any of the colors that come from um, the color section. I could write in my own hex or RGB value, um, but I'm just gonna scroll and select this one. And now my primary colors on my blog card are being updated and I get this orange color. So we now have our blog cards updated. We're ready to uh, hit publish, go to our Atlas destination, hit publish, and that'll start rolling through uh, where if you, you know, you have a whole, the whole publish system, the wait in line, load project, build, and publish project. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And I don't know if we have any other questions, but if we want to keep rolling for the sake of time, I'll quickly show the NPM package because maybe, you know, your client is asking, you know, this this site doesn't have enough pop. You know, let's let's give them some more pop. Um, so you found this really amazing particle saying, and we're going to give them pop. <laughs> we're just going to throw emojis and whatever else on there. This is coming from NPM um, and just installing that package and then copying the code straight into Clutch. I've created this React Particles component here, and now you have that inside Clutch. But as a, you know, as a designer, you know, you don't want to have to mess with all those properties themselves. Um, the, the, you know, as a designer, you don't want to mess with all those properties or the code itself. Um, so maybe somebody like Luis, who's a developer, has gone through and created properties for designers to be able to quickly use and set up a list of properties that I can change myself to make these look great for oh, nice. the client. Um, so, you know, change that to a star, maybe change the color. And so, sorry, let me, let me just clarify what's happening here for the, for myself and for YouTube, right? So you, you imported this NPM package, sort of copied that code component directly into clutch. And yep. now you've bound that UI that we're seeing right now to those properties that that component was like created to accept. Correct. Yeah. So wow. I, I'm just setting, you know, background color um, with these properties and those are just okay. being passed into this code that was edited just for the sake of this demo here. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really yeah. neat. That that functionality yeah. so, just like, I mean, it just it enables a lot more people to use this stuff and, and, and sort of really lowers the, the need for a developer to do everything. And you've wired up one thing and now, yeah, you can come in here and, and change these at your will. That's really cool. And one thing I want to point out about this even is um, the way to think about this is you really only need to use your developer bench to build 10% of the components, 5% of the components. They're gonna be doing a few things, but they're building these Lego sets because once this thing is wrapped once or once this thing is kind of mapped over to become designer friendly once, throw it in your throw it in your component library for your whole team. And now everybody can go use particles on sites. Everybody can go use animation libraries, transitions. So that's what you're doing. You're using your developers to build Legos for your designers. Okay, yeah. All right, cool. So it looks like, and I think I scheduled this for a little bit longer and we can obviously go as long as we want. We're at uh, 54. So I don't know if y'all want to do, do a Let's couple more de minutes of demo. Yep, yeah. yeah, we got to get to the one more thing, baby. We got the okay. more stuff this little cup. One more thing. Sorry, hang on with us. Yeah, yeah. All right, Luis, you're up, man. All right, I'll 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 take it over. Um, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alex, for the the overview of uh, you know typical uh, workflow in Clutch. I'm going to be sharing my screen here uh, in a moment. Just give me a second. And oh, this one. There we go. Oh, shoot. We missed. We missed. Alex is one more thing. Oh, oh no. OK, gonna... go back. Hurry up. Hurry up. We're going to go back, back to Alex. Yes, Take it we over. didn't show you all the coolest, it. the coolest part of his thing before we get over to Luis's thing, which is performance. Alex, yeah, let me, yeah, let me share. Yes, I, I lost performance. <laughs> <laughs> let me. <laughs> uh, I lost my screen share. And but, you get okay. one more thing. And yeah, you yeah. get one more thing. Um, I was we hoping to have this thing. this part published already. We're almost there, but I um, I thankfully already saved a page speed insights. Um, of the project itself. So we can see uh, the preview of this, that this is the exact project that I was just working on. Um, and so this is Google's PageSpeed Insights um, tacking our, our web vitals at all greens um, for mobile and desktop. And 
that's everything that you saw today. All the components that I built, I didn't do anything more than just adding values and changing some CSS values and uh, bringing in um, my backend using WordPress. So I want to point out, yeah. we didn't add any performance plugins to that WordPress backend that's running on WP Engine. There's none. That's a vanilla install of WordPress with just Faust and Yoast. And then plugged that in to Clutch and got these scores. We watched a video a month ago from uh, one of the tutorial websites of a guy spending two hours trying to teach people to make their web WordPress site perform it. After two hours of telling you about varnish and cache and total cache and this, that, and the other and all this stuff, he got it to a whopping like 64 and was like, that's good enough and then moved on. When you use Clutch, without thinking about performance, you're getting 93s, 94s, and 100s. No extra effort. So that was kind of a big deal. I didn't want to miss that one. All right. With that one done, let's move on to Luis. All right. I'll take it over now. <laughs> so now for the one more thing of the one more thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm Luis, by the way. I'm a developer at Clutch. And I got a little bit uh, uh, of a cute thing to, to, to show you today. So Alex showed you like kind of What's like the the workflow of building that sort of uh, of a, a headless uh, WordPress blog, so front end for for your WordPress. But you know sometimes you have uh, a few more requirements, especially if you work at an agency or something like that. So let's say for the sake of example um, that you know the client that's building these uh, this blog or the, the individual that is building this blog, well um, he wants to use like a uh, recipe card because it's the food blog after all, right? Smoking meats. Um, so they want to kind of have like uh, recipes uh, in some of their blog posts. And the typical way uh, you'd go at it, uh, as you can see, you've got uh, the WordPress uh, content editor right here, the new editing experience with Gutenberg, where everything is a blog. Uh, you add text, that's a, a blog, that's solid. A single unit um, that comes in in your data, especially if you're using WP GraphQL, it comes isolated as just one unit. Uh, if you use an image, that's one unit as well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the way uh, you know that you typically typically go at this as a content editor is you know you'd start typing oh my brisket recipe and yada yada yada, and then you'd list all the ingredients and the steps and everything, but you know that's that's a little bit messy, especially if you're trying to stay on brand and if you if you're trying to conform to some sort of you know consistency uh, in your layout and everything. So as developers, what we usually do is we build something that's uh, you know a little bit more static. Okay, give them some custom feel, something like that. Bind it to the layout. Uh, do something like. Uh, I don't know, something like this, like a, a recipe card that uh, that I've done in Clutch. But, you know, you have those uh, predefined um, fields that are really stuck and they go into a specific um, part of your layout and they're just there. And what content editors usually want is, yes, they want to have this consistency and they, they want to have a reliable way of filling in a few inputs and you know having the 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 front end display what they want in a consistent manner but you know they also want some creative liberty so they want to be able to put this recipe card maybe at the top maybe after the first paragraph maybe below the fold maybe after an ad you know there's all sorts of uh, or so all sorts of things that you, you where you may want to um, put this recipe card, you know, at, at any given point in your uh, blog post. So what we've done is basically we um, got into uh, a little bit deeper into Fast and one of its cool new little features. It's very, I think, two or three weeks old at this point, which is the ability to actually turn components, uh, including clutch components, because they're React components after all into WordPress blocks. So what I've uh, went ahead and, and done is not only just build this recipe card that you can fill in with whatever data you 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 may want and plug it into, you know, in, in some specific part of your layout, 
But actually, I pushed it over to WordPress, to our WP Engine instance uh, of WordPress, and uh, it's coming in here as a blog. So all the content editors need to do is just start typing, you know, recipe card. They got a recipe card right here. Um, it's coming pre-filled with all those default values uh, that we've seen before, just, you know, as a, a nice touch. And so that I don't have to type uh, this whole thing right here live and I can I can spare you those moments. Uh, but, you know, you've got basically fields for, for everything and they can just fill in these fields uh, in this uh, neat little form that Faust is actually uh, providing as a, uh, an editing tool. And once you click out, you get, you know, a little bit of a preview. We're still working, um, as I said, this is early feature. So yep. we're still working Very on trying early. to bring in, uh, you know, some more of theme and trying to make it look like uh, what it will actually look like in your, in your front end. But basically, uh, you just, you know, create your recipe card anywhere in your content. You click update or save your new post or uh, whatever. And you'll be able, if I can click here, you'll be able to basically see it live. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, I designed this in Clutch. You were seeing in Clutch basically the um, dark uh, dark mode preview in here that can toggle. So light mode or dark mode, and it should work uh, in dark mode as well. So wow. basically, it just comes in uh, pre-filled uh, with everything. But you know that's uh, that's not all. Um, sometimes uh, you also need to um, you know if you're doing a recipe card and you're doing a, a food blog, um, obviously SEO does matter to you uh, a heck of a lot. And recipe cards are actually a very powerful way of getting rich previews in Google search results and also boosting uh, some of your blog posts up because. You know, when you're looking for a recipe on Google, that's sometimes where you'll go and you get like a rich preview. It's appealing to, to everyone and all of that. So what I went ahead and, and done here in, in Clutch is actually I included a, a good component that as a developer uh, I've made that is basically just, you know, taking in uh, a lot of these properties that go into this block. And uh, it's basically just feeding into this component that is producing uh, LD plus JSON, so a set of metadata that goes into the page itself. And what it ends up doing is if we go in here and copy our URL and post it really quick, and it should only take a moment, uh, is we're going to validate on these Google search results tool, uh, this testing tool, if our metadata is correct. And if it is, it should be producing a neat little, little recipe. So. There we go. And it has found a get a recipe and the recipe, they're both the same. They, it says that there's some non-critical issues, which, uh, you know, it's it's normal because we don't have a video for this recipe yet. We, we don't have ratings yet on this blog, so it, that's that's fine. But you, you'll see that pretty much everything else, you know, it, it just comes in here and, and it's fitting to basically what Google would crawl uh, for your website. So I can actually preview some results. You'll see that, you know, it's it's taking your uh, all the details for, for the recipe just as we put them in there with the stats, with the ingredients and everything, and it will render beautifully into, into Google. So this is a way of, you know, not only offering some consistency, uh, also some creative freedom uh, within that consistency uh, to your content editors. Uh, you don't have to have them, you know, mess around with clutch or be stuck with just a given layout. Uh, but also, it's a way of possibly boosting your uh, SEO rankings. So wow. that's that's it. I think I I covered it all on this. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, integrating even more features of FOSS uh, in the near future and uh, polishing this just a little bit. So expect that. You know, once we release, um, we'll have uh, have some great things. Yeah, th thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. And so that is a really, really new feature of Faust. I mean, I think I sent this to you all, like the proof of concept example, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. And so we just sort of got uh, a live release out there. And it's awesome to see that you all have kind of been playing around with that. Um, but we really feel like 
that that was part of the really the last missing piece of you know making making headless WordPress way more enjoyable for everybody because just the the idea of the developer or in this case the you know the clutch designer being able to create a component and then push that back into WordPress just makes the editing experience for the people creating the content so much better. And I love that for you all in this demo, it wasn't just a visual thing that you actually showed, hey, let's look at how this structured data that we sort of create in the block and pull out in you know, a structured way from GraphQL can, can actually help you with SEO because I think that's, that's often overlooked. Um, and also the other cool thing is when we think about you know, headless WordPress in general, and maybe maybe there are multiple different sites or multiple different things using that, you know, with that content blocks plugin integration that Faust provides, you get that card back as structured data. It's not just HTML and so that you can uh, do some things with it uh, in, other, in other rendering environments, I guess, if you want to. Um, cool. So let me, I'm actually going to take back over the screen if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then we'll, um, let me uh, get Google... Ooh, Chrome fired back up. Um, give me one sec. Yeah, there we go. All right. And yeah, so we got a couple of call to action. So, so thanks for hanging in there with us, folks. That was all really impressive stuff. Um, so for next steps in turn, if you're interested in Clutch and interested in what we've shown here, definitely check them out at clutch.io. I think, right, the website built with Clutch. Um, so, you know, Come out here, join the wait list. Um, that's sort of step one. Follow them on Twitter at Clutch Creator. Let me see if I can open that uh, back up. Uh, and definitely give them a follow to um, get some more information on the launch. So give them a follow. Hopefully everybody does that here. Um, and then if you are an agency looking for early access, reach out to Vidya at clutch.io and join their partner program, get early access into this tool. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we'll, we'll probably be doing some additional collaborations in the future. Um, so definitely give us a, a, a check out too, if you will. Um, so I got a couple shameless plugs on our end as well. Um, WP Engine obviously has invested a ton of money and time and energy into building the headless WordPress ecosystem. Really proud of all the work that we've done. Um, and sort of the crown jewel of that is Atlas Hosting. Um, we're one of the, we're really the first kind of headless WordPress focused host end to end. You get your node environment, uh, you get a WordPress backend. So definitely give us a check out uh, for your next project. And then if you're interested in joining our community, um, I always point people to our Discord. We've got about 1400 people in there now. Uh, it's growing every day. Um, this is where the magic happens, where, where Matthew sort of joined and we, we met and talked about this collaboration. Um, so developers.wpengine.com slash discord will get you in there. Um, and we'd love to see you. And with that, I'll kick it over. And I think we can spend a couple minutes asking, answering some questions if anybody has them. Um, I know I thought we had one in the chat about sourcing directly from Figma. And I'll just restate it for, for the YouTube stream later. Uh, somebody asked about sourcing, uh, basically importing Figma designs as a starting point. Uh, Matthew said that's probably a Q2, Q3 uh, 2024 feature. Um, so cool. Anybody else got questions, comments? Do throw them in the chat. And to the people on the Clutch team, thanks again for reaching out uh, about, about this collaboration. It's been really cool to learn about your product. Um, and it's just, it, there's so much cool there. There's, there's so many cool things there to dig into, so. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, WP Engine. Um, this was this was awesome. I've yeah, it's awesome to see Faust enabling additional builders. Like that's that's really the dream too. And, and part of, you know, my job over the last, really two, two years I've been here has really been focused on building that ecosystem. And so seeing more people get into the space, start creating their own products. It just, it's a, it's a sign that what we've been doing has been working. Um, and it's, it's, it's awesome to see all of the products and stuff take shape. Cool. Cool. Anybody got any questions? No, like I said, this, this recording will be up in the next couple of days. I'll post about it. Um, on our Twitter account, uh, Give us a follow on YouTube at WPE Builders, um, and I'll send the recording uh, to the Clutch team and make sure that they they distribute that out to, 
to you all, anybody here from any of their lists. Um, but awesome. Anybody else got anything? Matthew, you want to close us down with anything? No, I just want to repeat uh, what Alex said. Just uh, thanks for the opportunity to get in front of uh, the headless community. And and main thing is, is I'm just excited to actually start working uh, shoulder to shoulder with y'all because I think that uh, that there's something here. If we can really focus on building this this visual builder, which is a, a specific niche, because there's always going to be, be people want to build it all in code. Mm -hmm. But if we can focus on that and we can work with y'all shoulder to shoulder to build out Faust as a platform play, I think that, yeah, I think we're going to build something awesome. I think that we could we could uh, put definitely make WordPress the the lead headless backend. Ah, well, well, I, I want like the sound thing, of that. I read that on your LinkedIn, yeah. um, but I I, uh, I do want to point out something that there are visual CMSs out there now. Net, Netlify just bought one. And, uh, but that's all that it is. You don't create your components in there. You don't do that. It's just a visual CMS. Imagine that it's just Gutenberg basically. And then there are page builders and we have this opportunity where WordPress could be the first one that both it's all, it's all one thing, but it has all the benefits of headless. Like to me, there, there's the Holy grail. You want the visual CMS with the block editor. Mm -hmm. You want the page builder because you don't want to lose that one which if you go all Gutenberg, you kind of don't have a great page building experience, but we can get both. And you want to go headless so that you can shove your front end all the way onto the edge. And if you get all three, whoever gets all three of those things put together, I think is going to basically win the next sort the of like round of the internet. Internet the 5 infinity, whatever, Yeah, whatever. the infinity stones yeah. of the internet. And I'll also point out too that, you know, while everything you all showed with Clutch was focused on WordPress, this could have been any back end. Like the, some of the early demos they showed me had just were Star Wars APIs and, you know, it could be Shopify. So like really when you think about where Headless really shines in knitting together all these disparate data sources, like you all have just added an easy button on top of that that doesn't require a bunch of code too. So like there's way more stuff I think that this thing could, could do and definitely future demos that we'll have to collaborate on in the future. Um. But awesome. Yeah. So thanks again, everybody for coming. I think if we don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and, and clo close it down for today. But thanks. Thanks for everybody for hanging out. Uh, later days, y'all. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, See you around. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.